What? What's up, you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. This episode is going to be a bit special because we're going to do a bit of a compilation episode. All of these episodes have been released on the channel before, but I've decided to make it into a compilation for easier viewing pleasures. Now, the first one is going to be about remote and local file inclusion, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, you amazing hackers. I hope you're all doing well today. So when you clicked on this video, you probably wanted to find out what local file inclusion was or remote file inclusion. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit more about local file inclusion and the next video is going to be a remote file inclusion. So let's get right into it, shall we? So I have this BWAP here, which is a buggy web application, which is developed by OWASP. I really like trying to hack this thing because it's really well made, I would say. You can find the source code, so it's interesting because it's kind of a white box hacking, you know, you know what you're doing. So the first thing I did was I was looking up this code, of course, but I know what local file inclusion is. So let's get right into it, shall we? When you see here, you can select the language. So we, for example, we're going to take English. <coughs> you have a few parameters here, like your language and your action. So I can replace this parameter language with, for example, dot 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 and then backslash and i do this because uh i just insert an ar arbitrary amount of dots and backslashes because i want to make sure that i end up in the root directory so when you know a little bit about linux you know that a dot dot uh, backslash is going like a step back in your folder structure and then i just want to get etc password so when i do this you can see that the variable of etc password is printed in here directly into the page. So this is local file inclusion. I can get any file onto the system that I want. So that's what that was pretty much it. It's pretty simple. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it brought you some value. value. So I hope I'll see you also in the next one. Bye. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that one. We are back. The next one is going to be a bit about two-parter series. It's going to be about test automation in bug bounty hunting. I hope you enjoy this one. See you soon. Hello, you amazing hackers. I hope you're doing well today. You're watching an episode of my brand new series, which is going to be just a two-part series, but it's going to be about test automation in penetration testing. And I'm going to make an episode about why you should use automation in penetration testing and also an episode about why you shouldn't use uh, automation and penetration testing. So uh, let's get right into it, shall we? I hope you enjoy. Thank you. All right, now let's get into why you should probably be using automation for your penetration testing. Now, you guys are all hackers. You guys probably already know how to script. If you don't know how to script, you should probably learn a little bit of bash scripting, some Python scripting. Uh, and when I say automation, what I mean by this is mostly that you should automate the things that you have to do more than once on your own way. Now, I mentioned a few words in that sentence that are very important. First of all, your own way. You should automate them, not somebody else, because somebody else will have a particular way of thinking and using the application. Well, you will think about the application in a completely different way. So you have to make sure that you can at least understand what is being written and adapt it to your own needs. And second of all, you should automate the things that you have to do more than once. Now, of course, if something takes a lot of effort to automate, maybe you have to think if it's worthwhile. But first of all, you will learn more scripting because when you have to automate something, you're practicing your scripting skills. Uh, and second of all, uh, of course, when you're automating, you have to make sure that um, you don't start. How do I put this? You don't put too little effort into something that should be automated easily. So, for example, I'm just going to uh, give you guys a stupid example. IDORS. I've given you at least seven or eight ways to automate either searching you should be automating it. You should not be manually changing numbers or identifiers. You should be automating that kind of stuff by now. So it's very important that you know what to automate, when to automate it, 
and that you don't start using somebody else's scanner without using exactly without knowing exactly what you're doing because first of all there might be some issues with that script that you can't debug but second of all you need to know what you're doing at all times you're attacking you're hacking something and you cannot just start running code that you don't understand the things you're doing can be dangerous you're actually in production systems most of the time when you're bounty hunting so that's something you really shouldn't forget you should of course automate stuff that you really uh, that you have to do more than once that that's always my motto i'm a really lazy person so everything that i can i do automate but i'm also very cautious that i don't start automating too much um, now i'm going to speak a little bit from my software testing experience uh, in software testing we have this thing called the testing triangle and it dedicates uh, a different amount of effort to each type of testing and uh, the test automation the the actual ui and api test automation is a very small part in our testing and that's because those automations cost a lot of money they cost a lot of effort that's something you're also going to notice when penetration testing of course when you automate something it's going to cost you a lot more effort than when you do it manually but you ha always have to ask yourself, uh, is what I'm doing worth it to warrant a return on investment for automating this? Um, it's very important that, that the stuff that you can automate, that you automate them as well. Because if you don't, you're going to have a significant disadvantage to the people who can automate their stuff. So that was a little bit of, of my thoughts. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please leave a like up. Um, it really helps with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, also, please subscribe. We'll be doing a giveaway real soon. We'll give away one month of Hacked Box uh, when we reach 1500 subscribers. So uh, once again, I really do hope you guys enjoy it. Tomorrow's episode is going to probably be about uh, a bug bounty methodology attacking web applications. But I'm not really sure about that yet, so it could be anything. Um, I really do hope you enjoy it and I hope you have a nice day. Bye! Hello you amazing hackers, I hope you're doing well today. You're watching an episode of my brand new series which is going to be just a two part series but it's going to be about test automation and penetration testing and I'm going to make an episode about why you should use automation in penetration testing and also an episode about why you shouldn't use uh, automation in penetration testing. So uh, let's get right into it shall we, I hope you enjoy. Thank you. All right, let's get started, shall we? So how are you today? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why you shouldn't use automation in your penetration testing. Now, um, there are, I'm going to make a second video, as I already said, about why you should use uh, automation in your pen testing. Because according to me, uh, in my humble opinion, there are many advantages and disadvantages to automation. One of the biggest disadvantages, in my opinion, is that automation is stupid. It can only do exactly what you tell it to do. So if there are any scenarios that it didn't expect, it runs into an issue. Now that's already a problem because that means that your automation cannot just be plug and play for any of your targets. So you have to know exactly what you're doing. That's another disadvantage of using automated scripts for your penetration testing. Now, if you write your own scripts, you know what you're doing. So, of course, that's a lot less of an issue. But I see a lot of people use, pro, for example, XSS Hunter, and they're not really aware that XSS Hunter only looks for reflect cross-site scripting. Um, and as you guys know from watching my channel, there are many different types of cross-site scripting. So, um, you really have to know what you're doing. Another disadvantage of using automation in penetration testing. Um, and then, of course, the biggest disadvantage that I know of uh, and that I can think of is that all of these automated scanners, for example, OpenVos, you've got Burp Pro, which will automatically look for vulnerabilities. Um, there are many different variations, uh, of course, but all of these scanners are probably already used by your target. If your target has any moderation of a brain, they're going to use these, tar these scanners because they only cost a few hundred, maybe a few thousand dollars. But if they put up a bug bounty program and they don't fix those vulnerabilities, 
other people have those scanners too. So it's going to cost them a lot more, potentially tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars if they don't run those scanners before they bring their target to the bug bounty program. So those are three main disadvantages that I see when you run uh, automated scanners and bug bounties. You really have to know what you're doing. Um, your automated scanners are probably already run by the companies themselves. And when your automated scanner runs into an issue, it's going to have a real issue because it cannot think like a human. So it's going to try and repeat the actions that you set out for it and it's going to fail. So those are three big disadvantages of why you probably shouldn't use automation. Now, of course, there are also big advantages, which I'm going to cover in the next video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this small video. Uh, I wanted to make this because I have a little bit to say about automation. So thank you for listening to my bullshit. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like up. Um, please also, if you have any other disadvantages that I didn't think of, leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you enjoyed the content, leave a like. Uh, I really appreciate that because it helps with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, and also subscribe because when we hit 1,500 subscribers, we're going to do our first giveaway. We're going to be giving away one month of Hectobox for free. So uh, make sure your friends and all of your family subscribe as well so we can start that giveaway really soon. Uh, I, ho I hope I'll see you guys in the next video and uh, bye. All right, amazing hacker. Now, if you're like me and you're tired of typing out your scope manually every single time, I'm going to show you guys a cool way on how to import your scope into Burp Speed straight from Hacker One. I hope you enjoy. See you soon, amazing. Hello, you amazing hackers. How are you today? I hope you're all doing well. I have a bit of a special episode today. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a practical tip. Um, it's something I've come across quite often and I find really useful. So uh, some of you might already know Hacker One. A lot of you are probably already registered on Hacker One. Uh, I went to the website and I took a random uh, target. So for example, right now I have Roblox open. Now when I scroll down completely on the page, as you can see, there is a scope section and in the scope section, you can download a Burp Suite project config file. Now, when I click that, and now I'm going to open up my Burp Suite and I'm going to start a new project. So I'm going to be showing you guys how to import this specific project configuration file into your Burp project. Now, as you can see, I have an update, just going to skip that a new project as you can see i already tried this before i also try things before i record my videos of course oh sorry about that noise by the way something dropped all right so when you have burp open you can see at the top there is a project option now you should go to the project options in the drop down and you should load project options now as you can see there's already a few roblox let's see here there we go, there are already a few, oh, sorry about this, by the way, gotta get my Roblox, there we go. Now I have my JSON file here that I just downloaded from Hacker One, and I'm just going to open this file. Now you guys probably won't see any changes, and that's pretty, uh, that's because all of the changes happen in the background, it's pretty normal. So I'm going to show you guys this when you open up your target tab and then your scope tab. As you can see, my scope is already filled in. I didn't have to do anything and I can just start routing whatever I want through Burp and I can start hacking properly. Now, if there are includes, if there are excludes, everything from your scope is just going to be filled in. And I'm sorry about that noise as well. I dropped something else. <laughs> I really shouldn't keep things on my lap when I film these videos. I keep dropping that stuff. So uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to show you guys. Uh, you can easily import your project scope in Burp from Hacker HackerOne. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this small tip bit. If you did, please leave a like. It really helps the channel. Uh, also, please subscribe because when we reach 1,500 subscribers, we're going to do a giveaway for you guys. We're going to give away one month of Hectobox for free. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. See you in the next one. Bye. So when you are a professional bug bounty hunter, you've followed all of these tips. 
what comes next of course you need to take notes let's get some tips on note taking shall we how are you all doing today you amazing hackers hope you are doing well so i have a quick video for you today on taking notes because somebody asked me in the slack channel i'll also put the comment in the video right now thank you for that suggestion by the way so first of all let me get something out of the way i'm not good with taking notes i'm terrible at taking notes but I have my strategy and it's worked for me and I want to present it to you guys in the way that I would take my notes. If you guys have any other suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. I'll also making a, be making a community edition out of this. So uh, first of all, of course, when you have multiple domains, you have to do a subdomain enumeration. That's why I make a separate group. Uh, so I make a section group and in that section group, so google.com is here in my section group, I'll make a new section for recon and I'll add a page for subdomain enumeration. I'll add my specific tool in here and what subdomains I got from that tool. Now I'll also do a page for OSINT and when I have some results I'll note them down. When I do a dork I'll just note down the dork and if I don't get any results I'll also note down no results. But I'm not going to be spending uh, a lot of time noting down results that are not useful. So for example if I found something doing OSINT if I found an API key but that API key is only valid for a test environment with test data I know that when I report that bug it's not going to get fixed so I just note it down I found blah 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 it's not going to get fixed it shouldn't run this again so um, that's something I do something useful of course also my other tools that I run I also put in here um, I have some secure shell scripts that I created. If I find valid output, I'll put it in here. If I don't, I'll put no useful output. That way I know I won't have to be using it again and I'll just put a minus in front of it. And if there is useful output, I'll just put a plus in front of it. And that way I know that there's something useful in this specific page. So those are some things that I do for recon. I'll also have a separate section for interesting notes and then here I'll put stuff like for example accounts.google.com failed to load two out of three times. This might be useful in the future. It's not always useful in the future but it might be. So that's why I just keep them in separate tab. Now when I have my subdomain that I want to attack I'll have uh, another section group in this uh, main section group. Uh, and I'll recon my subdomain first. I'll do stuff like nmap, nikto, gobuster, and I'll note down all those results. So for this case, I do note down all the results because it's really hard for me to know what's useful and what's not at this stage. So I'll just note down anything. Sorry for the noise, by the way, that's my ferret. Uh, so when I find something useful, I'll also put a star in front of this specific page because uh, that way I know from the overview which page has interesting stuff in it. If there's nothing interesting, um, I don't usually put a minus in front of the single domains because I'm not 100% sure when something's useful and when something's not. So uh, when you have your recon done, of course you're going to do some endpoint mapping. Now when you're browsing your website and you have Burp Suite Pro or Burp Suite Free running in the background, you can export a sitemap after you're done browsing the website and that will contain all the URLs that Burp encountered. So you can paste them in here as well and this will allow you to test some more. So when you find a bug you can go through all of the specific URLs and you can see if the bug is still valid on the other URLs as well. That's a tip I have for you guys, do that. Because um, often what we call in software testing there is a fallacy of uh, clustering of bugs which means that when you find a bug, often there are other similar bugs related to that bug around that functionality. So that's why I always keep all of the URLs and I'll always test all of them. Also possibly some functional notes, um, for example, you have to be 18 to register, that kind of stuff. I can keep that in my functional notes tab. Now when I go on to exploiting, uh, first of all, of course, I have my checklist. This will also be in the description below for you guys. Uh, I go through my complete checklist and when I find something on this I make a separate page and in this page I'll describe the steps that I have to take before I report my bug. Now I'll also do a separate video on reporting because I think that's an important topic. Um, of course I also have a notes page on here 
in this node page I'll put weird stuff that I find for example NLT uh, is filtered by web application filter I might be able to use this to put this specific filtered word between another filtered word and that way uh, maybe the NLT only gets filtered out and my filtered word gets true so some weird stuff that, that I can note down in here um, some people have asked me before if I enter a percent sign the server crashes is that a security bug no it's not but I would note it down anyway because it might be useful later on you never know so um, those are the notes that I would take again if you have any suggestions please leave them down in the comments below I'm sure you guys have done this way better than me this is one of my weakest points um, but I hope you still enjoyed the video anyway uh, please leave a like up if you did um, it really helps with the YouTube algorithm and I hope I'll see you in the next video bye so amazing hacker we are back does anybody of you know security.txt well did you know that it's invented by this amazing guy called ad overflow ed if you're watching this one much love from the community your tools are awesome let's get right into the video shall amazing we? hackers hope you are all doing well today uh first of all i have a quick announcement to make today i'll be receiving my new microphone so uh, i hope the audio quality will improve of course i hope so because the microphone cost me enough money so let's hope it does now uh, what i want to show you today is um, how to find a target using google dorks when you're doing bug bounties because um, there are the well-known platforms you guys probably all know hacker one integrity bug crowd but what if you don't want to go to one of those platforms i've mentioned before that you can just search google for things that have security programs um, but how do you find a target that has a security program well i've created a google dork for you guys so as you can see it's just uh, security.txt and file type double point txt but when you use this dork, you'll find all the well-known security.txt files. So for example, if we open one of those, when we go to the molly.com website, you can see that there is a security contact, there is an encryption policy, there is a policy to read for responsible disclosure, there are signatures that you can do. So as you can see, there every single one of these can be your target if you want. You just have to make sure that you well, of course, this is a little bit different, but just look for the well-known security.txt files using this dork, and that way you can find a lot of um, a lot of targets. Now, of course, cloud for the, for is going to be difficult, but there you go. This way, you can find some targets that not a lot of people are hacking on. Um, the biggest advantage of this, oh, sorry, went too far back there. So the biggest advantage of this is that you can go look for those targets that a lot of people don't know about or that a lot of hackers don't focus their attention on but it can get you some reputation in the bug bounty game and it can get you some valid bugs which which might land you in halls of fame it might get you some swag it might get you a small reward so that's what i wanted to show you guys you can go to the bigger platforms like integrity hacker one bug crowd or you can just search for the security.txt file Thank you guys for watching and I hope you have a nice day and I'll see you in tomorrow's video. Bye. So you've been through all of these tips, you have your note taking, you have your tools, but how are you going to automate those tools? You can automate them manually, like just write a script, boring old stuff, or you can use Docker. Docker is amazing guys. This next video is going to be all about Docker. I hope you enjoy and I'll see you soon. Hello you amazing hackers, today I'll be showing you docker for hacker, well docker for what I consider to be a way to use it when you are hacking. So when I come across a few of these tools that I see some of you hackers use, for example Lazy Hunter, which I came across on Twitter, which I just had open here, sorry, this Lazy Hunter here. Um, there are other tools such as Damn Vulnerable Web Application. Um, there are a lot of tools that you can try using on docker. So what Docker really is, is it's a container. So I know most of you guys probably know what a virtual machine is. So you can imagine a container sort of like a virtual machine, but it's not exactly like a virtual machine. It's, uh, in fact, there are a lot of differences between the two, but you can sort of imagine it. So what Docker will do is it will start up 
whatever it needs to run your application. So for example, if I choose a base Ubuntu image, it'll start up Ubuntu and it'll start, for example, in this Docker image, it'll have his tool specifically will need, um, how do I put this? It will need a web server. So Lazy Hunter will start up on a web server. So what Docker will do is it'll start up the operating system virtually, and then it'll start up a web server and it'll run the tool specifically so that we can access it easily. Now, what Docker is, is just a containerization of, so it's putting all of the stuff that you need into a container. So that would be your virtualization layer. That container specifically contains all of the commands that it needs to start up the web server and to start up the product. Now, to run something from the Docker Hub, so you have the Docker Hub, and here they describe all of the specific content that you can get for Docker. So for example, if I want a MySQL uh, Docker, MySQL Server Enterprise Edition Docker, uh, I can just go there, I can pick one from the community, for example, a MySQL server. And as you can see, I have a complete description and a complete Docker file of MySQL. So what you need to do to install some of these tools is just go to docker.com and then products slash docker desktop. I'll put that in the description as well. And you need to download the Docker client. Now I'm running on Mac, of course, but you can also download one for Windows. And as you can see, I'm already running it. Now, when you're running your Docker client, there's always docker pull command on the Docker Hub. So you can just type in that docker pull command. Now, I already have this specific image, so it's nothing new. And then on the Docker Hub page, usually there is a prerequisites description. I already did this. Um, so you need to make the directories to put the logs and the uploads. And then you can just run the command that is on the quick start guide and it will sometimes have something for persistent storage and it'll have a command for non-persistent storage. Now when you see I'm running this Docker specifically in the background and it's running on a port, so in this case it's running on port 8888. So I can just visit this URL and as you can see right now I'm running Lazy Hunter in Docker. So there are more tools that you can do this with, for example, them vulnerable web application, you can do it with the OS2 shop. Uh, you can just explore the Docker Hub. So um, I hope this helped some of you guys. Uh, if you did, please leave a like and I hope I'll see you in the next video. Thanks and bye. And Uncle Red is back, guys. I hope you enjoyed that one. Now, not a lot of them left. So if you are enjoying this, let me know in the comments below. Leave me a like. I always appreciate it, guys. My heart goes out to you. Now, talk about filters. I freaking hate filters. We have to get around them. The next one is going to give you guys some tips, but as always, I expect you to do your own research into this topic because it's much more in depth than I can cover in any video. Hope you guys enjoy. Amazing hackers, great having you back again. Today I'm going to be teaching you a little bit about bypassing file extension filters. We're going to be using a null byte uh, to do that and I'm going to demonstrate on the, fer and on the juice shop made by OWASP. So, what I'm going to show you guys is we have this FTP folder that we found. In this FTP folder we have several files, for example acquisitions.md, legal.md, and all of these MD files can be downloaded. But we also have some other files, such as for example the backup file. But when we try to open this file we get a 403 error message. Only .md and .pdf files are allowed. So what we could try to do, for example, is try to just add PDF to the end, but it's going to tell us that this file does not exist. So there is this thing in uh, per, per, uh, penetration testing that we call a null byte. So um, I'm, what this null byte pretty much is, is a percent sign and then a null, uh, two annual, two zeros uh, after each other. And this null byte is going to tell the interpreter in the back end that it's going to be able to ignore everything that comes behind it. So when we try this for example, um, the server is going to read our URL and it's going to read the first part um, and it's going to download this, but the filter is going to read the whole part and it's going to see a PDF file um, and this is an allowed extension. So when we try to do this for example, we're still not going to be able to do it. 
because everything we try has to be URL encoded of course and a percent sign URL encoded equals percent 25 so what we're doing is we're saying this equals a percent sign percent zero zero so a null byte and then we put an allowed extension behind it this way the extension will not be picked up by the filter that is uh, not allowing us to download the file but it will be ignored by the download script itself so when we try this as you guys can see, we get the coupons file, um, and that's a different file. We get the coupons file as expected. Now we can, of course, also try this with other files. So we just copy this, and we go back to the FTP directory. There are some other files in here. So this one can also be downloaded. The YAML file cannot be downloaded either. So we just download that as well. Then we move on to the GD file. Let's download that as well. And we can also try the PyC file and the package.json.back file. So that's pretty much how you can subvert some file uh, type filters, some file type extension filters. This also works when you upload some files. So this works when downloading files, this can work when uploading files. Of course it won't work on every server but this is a trick I wanted to show you guys. I hope this can help some of you and I hope I'll see you in the next video. If this video added some value to your life please remember to like and subscribe. It really helps you with the YouTube algorithm and I hope I'll see you in the next time. Bye! Alright amazing hackers you are back. That was an amazing video even if I say so myself. On to the next one. Testing for idlers can seem like a daunting task. Do I really have to go through each and every single one of these URLs myself? No. There is a solution for you guys. It's called Authorize. Check it out in the next video. Hope you guys enjoy. See you guys soon for the last one. Hello you amazing hackers. Great having you back today. I'm going to show you how to do some idler automation with Burp Authorize. It's a pro extension that you guys can get. Um, Burp Pro is pretty expensive but it's uh, an investment in your future especially if you're a bug bounty hunter. So I have the OWASP shoe shop open. I already made two accounts for you guys and I have my Burp proxy running in the background with my target using an advanced scope control and I'm capturing any request going to Heroku. Uh, I'm using the Heroku app to host my OWASP shoe shop. And I also have my proxy open and my HTTP history tab. First things first, I'm going to clear everything that's in here. Clear my history. There we go. And I'm going to log into my first account. So I have an account here, idol one I'm going to log in. And I'm going to go to the request that I captured. I'm going to take this cookie. And this is the cookie that I'm going to paste in the authorize, um, in the authorize tab that I have open. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to log off this account because that will be my test account, my either test account. And I'm going to log into my second account. Now, when I do that, I'm going to start my authorize. Authorize is on as you can see now. And the first thing I'm going to do is add something to my basket. As you can see, I place the item in the basket and I'm going to go to the specific request. Now, when you look at the request in this tab, it's really important that you look at the right item. So as you can see, it made a GET request to the basket of number 10 and it bypassed the specific, uh, you know, the, it bypassed the authorization mechanism. How you can tell is when you switch from the configuration tab to the request response viewer tab. So it's important that you take the URL back in mind. So you're making a GET request to the basket number 10. And this is the original request. As you can see, it uses the cookie of, sec of user 2. And the response gives it the contents of the basket. The modified request uses the cookie that we gave it in the authorized tab. And the response also returned the basket content. And the unauthorized, unauthorized request it also returned the basket content, so of course that's not good. When we go to the post, so when we try to do a post to the basket, when we check out the modified response, we can see that we get a 500 internal server error and also on the unauthenticated response. 
this indicates that on this specific uh, call, on the post call, there isn't an IDOR, but on the GET call, you can see that there is an IDOR. You can see a lot of calls happening in the background, socket calls to Heroku, uh, Nexus Polar. This is all stuff that's not important to us, and that's why I keep telling you guys to watch the URL, because it keeps telling us that it bypasses specific uh, URLs, but these are open to everybody, so these are not important. Now the next call I'm going to make, I'm going to open my basket content again, and I'm going to check it out, and as you can see it bypassed it, so this confirms our suspicion, and I'm just going to confirm that in the original uh, response and a modified response, I get the same results. Sometimes it'll say bypassed, and the original response will have the original uh, response as intended, but the modified response will also return a 200, but it'll return um, the content based on the specific header that you gave it, so the cookies in here. That means that it'll give the content of the user you're locked in with. Then, in that case, it will really be an issue. So that's how you automate looking for IDORs. You can do a lot of things. For example, if I increase the amount here, it's going to also make a second call to a put request. And as you can see, it also bypassed it in here. We've got a success uh, on both calls. That's not intended. That's also an IDOR. I'm going to remove this item from my basket real quick. The delete call is enforced because the modified response gives a 404 not found and the original response gives a 200 ok. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you like this video, please leave a like. Uh, remember to subscribe, it really helps me out a lot. Thank you guys for watching and I hope I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye! And we are back for the last one guys. Now cross-site scripting is pretty cool. I really like cross-site scripting. You guys can probably guess that from my name. There's a really cool tool out there, you guys should really check it out, it's called XSS Hunter. In the next video I'm going to show you guys why. I hope you guys enjoyed this compilation style video and I hope I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye amazing hacker! Hey buddy, thank you for joining me again. Today I'm going to be showing you how to chain cross-site scripting into an account takeover. So cross-site scripting as you all know just executes some JavaScript on the ser on the computer of your target, uh, and I'm going to use the damn vulnerable web application to demonstrate. I'm going to do some basic cross-site scripting first. So I'm going to uh, put a confirm tag in here. See if this works. Script, and then I'm going to sign my guest book. And as you can see, the value is stored in the HTML code. Now to get an account takeover, I've opened my developer console and I've opened my storage tab. As you can see on my local host, I have a few cookies set. The most important one is the PHP session ID. Now, as you can see, there are a few flags that can be set on these specific cookies. Um, when the HTTP only flag is set to true, right now it is set to false, but when I set it to true, I will not be able to access this specific cookie from my JavaScript. I can only access it from the HTTP. Um, secure means that it can only be set on an HTTPS connection. Uh, and same side, well, that's pretty obvious. So I'm going to give you guys a, a code snippet real quick. So uh, again, I open my script tag. I put in an alert JavaScript function. And I, this time I want to alert my document.cookie. So I want to see what cookies I have in my guestbook. First we're going to receive the pop-up from the previous alert that we inserted. And now we get all of the cookies. And as you can see, I can just access this PHP session ID. Now I'm going to change a few things here. I'm going to put HTTP only to true, clear my guestbook real quick. And then I'm going to sign again. Uh, and as you can, oh, I'm going to of course have to fill in a name. As you can see, I can no longer access the cookie. Uh, now only security as low is returned. So there are a few things you can do in this case. You can, for example, just create your own cookie. You can do document.create.document.cookies and you can insert your own cookie on a different path. For example, I can go insert my own session ID in the vulnerabilities path. And maybe depending on the configuration of the server, uh, it will take your session ID and perform the actions 
using your user instead of the one that is locked in. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, in this case, if I can steal the cookie, so if this is the case, there is a website I want to show you guys called XSS Hunter. So XSS Hunter is pretty much a tool that allows you to find any type of uh, any type of cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability. Because when I when I am able to get the cookies, so now I put my HTTP only flag to false again. I'm going to reload the page. As you can see now, I can get my cookie, but this is only executing on the target computer. So no way that I'm seeing this on my computer, and I need this value to take over an account. So what I have to do is get this session ID somewhere over to me uh, and to do that I usually use XSS Hunter. Now what XSS Hunter does is it gives you a couple of payloads, for example this one, it opens a script tag, um, it puts in a source and if you register for XSS Hunter, if you sign up, um, you get a few payloads that you can insert into your fields and those payloads are specifically tailored to for example, bypass content security protection. Um, there are a lot of payload probes uh, in there. Um, one of the cool things about XSS Hunter is that it allows you to look for blind XSS as well. So for example, if I were to take this um, specific script and insert it in here, into my message, and I would sign this as a guest book, of course it would have to have my subdomain in it. It'll execute some code to get the cookies and send them over to XSS Hunter. So that way XSS Hunter will tell you cookies can be stolen and it can be sent over to a, an external source pretty much. Um, so that's pretty much what how you can do account takeovers with cross-site scripting. You just have to make sure you can steal the cookie if you can steal the cookie, there are other ways, but it's going to be a lot harder, of course. Uh, one thing you can also do with cross-site scripting is find any information that is on the page. For example, here the name. I can take the names and I can send them to an external server um, that's not really that useful in this situation. But say, for example, you're able to insert a cross-site scripting vector into an invoice that way you can get all the items on the invoice and send them to an external server. That would be pretty nasty, of course. Not something we would want. So that's pretty much how you chain cross-site scripting into account takeover. You have to make sure that you are able to steal the flags, uh, the cookies. If you're not able to steal the cookie, try to insert your own cookie on a different path. Um, try to steal the data that is on the page. That's also a good one. Um, or try to do any action as the user because you can do any JavaScript you want. So for example, you can just click on here um, or for example, you can just make some code that automatically uh, put something in the name, put something in the message and sign the guest book. So it will be like, um, I don't know if you guys remember MySpace, um, but there was a post on there that would replicate itself. I think there was also a self-retweeting tweet a while ago. Those are all examples of cross-site scripting. So um, thank you guys for watching. I hope this was useful to you. Please leave a like if you thought this was useful. And I hope I'll see you in the next video. Bye.